So I'm pleased now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Donald Ingber. Uh, Dr. Ingberg is the founding director of the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. He is the Judah Folkman Professor of Vascular Biology at Harvard Medical School and of Vascular Biology Program at Boston Children's Hospital, as well as the Professor of Bioengineering at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Dr. Ingber is a pioneer in the field of biologically inspired engineering and at the Weiss Institute, he currently leads a multifaceted effort to develop breakthrough bio-inspired technologies to advance healthcare and improve sustainability. His work has led to major advances in uh, mechanobiology, tumor angiogenesis, tissue engineering, system biology, nanobiotechnology, and translational medicine. Please welcome Dr. Donald Ingber. Thank you so much. I, you know, as on behalf of just being a scientist in the scientific community, I want to thank the Allen Foundation and Tom for s supporting this type of exploratory research rather than incremental advances, which is what we're all used to, because this is really how you change the world. And Mike, who I've watched for many years, uh, it's just fantastic that you deserve this more than anybody because you've been a lone voice out there, and I know what it's like. So, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> so. Um, I've been a professor at Harvard Medical School for 33 years, but for the last uh, eight and a half, I've been the director of the Wiest Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, and um, that was founded based on the idea of trying to develop an institute that would pioneer the future of bioengineering. And we looked at bioengineering in the past, and it's been amazing in that it's transformed medicine by taking engineering principles, trying to solve medical problems you know, hip implants, pacemakers, drug delivery, you name it. But looking to the future, we realize that we've uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up that we're really at a point where we can harness that knowledge to develop new engineering innovations. And this idea of leveraging biology to develop engineering and, tech, and innovations and technologies is what we call biologically inspired engineering. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, and this is our logo, current logo, uh, is, um, Worked at from my lab over many years, and and some and what we've done at the Wiese Institute, which we'll start with basic fundamental principles of biology we've uncovered, and then how we've leveraged that to develop new engineering innovations. Now, I started out in the 1970s with the idea. I was interested in how living cells and tissues are constructed, this morphogenetic code, if you like, and I suggested. In, in a contrarian sort of way, that um, rather than being regulated by chemicals and genes, that development is controlled by mechanical forces, and this was not received very well at the time. Um, and why did I say this? Well, if you look at early development, this is the zebrafish embryo from the web, the, you know, the egg div it divides into 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. In the beginning, it's parsing out cytoplasm, but then the cells start generating mechanical forces in their cytoskeletons, actomyosin, and they start pulling on each other and physically sculpting all of the organs of the embryo. And so all the biochemistry and gene expression is functioning in a mechanically active and diverse environment. And I was trained in molecular biophysics where mechanical forces altered biochemistry of molecules by changing shape. So to me, it seemed pretty obvious that mechanics must impact biology, but again, that, that wasn't so clear. Now, when you take cells out of the, t take cells out of the body, put them on a dish, they grow in a polygonal form, but if you put them on a flexible substrate, they pull it into wrinkles. So even down to single cells, they're applying tension on their adhesions and other cells, and the shape they exhibit is a state of isometric tension, like a bow and a bowstring. Now, I had come up with a model of how cells are built, because in the 70s, people had first found they had a cytoskeleton, and the idea that these internal molecular filaments, cables, ropes, um, define cell shape, uh, was consistent with a, an observation I had in the art class where I saw what are called tensegrity sculptures from Buckminster Fuller architecture. And I had presented this idea that cell shape may be controlled through force balances in cytoskeletal filaments, but the idea then was that if you apply forces in an embryo, those forces would be transmitted over adhesion receptors to the cytoskeleton, and people were just realizing that most of the cellular metabolic machinery 
occurs when in a solid state effectively when immobilized on insoluble cytoskeletal filaments. So this led us to the idea that somehow distorting cells should be able to change their biochemistry and growth function and functionality. So to test this, we asked, does cell distortion control cell fate? And, I, and we developed many new technologies to get at this. But one was if you could take cells and you could adhere them to a substrate through extracellular matrix through their integrin receptors using a high density of matrix so you know you have high clustering of integrins because integrin clustering is known to induce signaling. And you give them saturating amount of growth factor so they have optimal growth factor signaling. But you make adhesive islands that are the size of single cells so that you could have a big island. What happens is the cell sticks, binds, pulls, flattens, flattens, and then stops when it's surrounded by a non-adhesive teflon-like region and you get a pancake-shaped cell. In the middle one, you get a cupcake-shaped cell if you make a smaller island, and at the right, you get a golf ball and a tee. So the only variable is distortion. And to do this, we collaborated with George Whitesides at Harvard, uh, who had developed an inexpensive way to make microchips for the computer industry, where instead of, photo, instead of photolithographic etching every little pattern like these circles, you do it once, and you make little holes, and then you pour a polymer of a silicon rubber that polymerizes, and when you peel it off, amazingly, it retains surface topography down to 60 to 90 nanometer resolution. And then you stamp multiple surfaces. And we had a series of science papers where we showed that if you make a big island and you put capillary endothelial cells, they're pancakes. And they, if you put them on a the round island, they're golf balls. And then if you break up this small island into many tiny dots, the cells actually spread from dot to dot like a suspension bridge so that they spread to the same degree as this, but they have that matrix contact area with this. And with various different cell types, we found that as you increase cell distortion, you get a concomitant increase in growth. As you prevent spreading, you induce apoptosis. If you make substrates with capillary cells that are in between degree of spreading, you let them form cell-cell contacts. They differentiate by forming capillary tubes with a hollow lumen, and they stop growing. If you make square ions, cells literally take the shape of the container, and if you give them the motility factors, they put out lamellipodia and philopodia, the exploratory process that drive movement, but they do it preferentially at the corners, whereas there's no bias in a round cell. And it turned out it's the mechanical stress concentrations in the corners that guides self-assembly of focal adhesions and biochemical processes like G-protein activation that drive this process. So very simply, we could switch cells between different cell fates of growth, differentiation, and apoptosis, just, and motility, just by how far they stretch. And we then went in vivo, we actually did this another way. We varied the, the, the stiffness of an extracellular matrix to which cells attach to in vivo. We used matrigel and cross-linked it to different degrees, and we put capillary cells on it, and we found that there's an optimum where they prefer uh, the, 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 the compliance of the matrix, and they increase their expression of the angiogenic factor receptor VEGFR2. And then we put that gel in vivo in animals, and this is where you see preferential angiogenesis. So in vivo, this is a nature paper, and we mapped out that this was mediated by transcription factor transport to the nucleus, which is mechanically controlled. And, and this was this. So this really confirmed the study that mechanics actually is, plays a major role in development. Now, this is sort of the background when um, the Institute was formed, and uh, we started to think about leveraging this for different technologies. And so one was this idea is, is this really important for organogenesis in the embryo? And I chose the tooth as the simplest model of organ formation because many epithelial organs form with the lining epithelial cells budding into a connective tissue filled with mesenchymal cells. And then there's a step where the mesenchymal cells, the fibroblast-like cells, condense. Uh, well, I'll go through that in a second. I'm sorry. So, so the, the tooth forms a bud that then buds in again, and you get roots, and you're done. If you do a lung, it would bud and bud and bud and branch. And so this is, it, it basically forms two buddings, and then you also get vessels and nerves moving in. So it's a real organ. It has connective tissue cells, epithelial cells. Now, this is how people in the, in, in the, in the genetics area and developmental biology area have been defining how this works for years. And they've mapped out genes and morphogens, and they're all important. You block them, it stops. But it doesn't explain how you actually build tissues with specific forms. And so, as I was saying, it's well known that almost all epithelial organs have a step where the mesenchymal cells, which are evenly distributed, come together and condense. It's called condensation. 
And that is a trigger for epithelial organ formation. The size of that dictates the size of the organ. And I always thought that this must be mechanical in some way. And we had a publication in Developmental Cell where we worked this out. I don't have time to go into it, but very simply, it turns out the epithelium puts out two different motility factors. One is uh, FGF8 that basically says, everyone in this room migrate towards me, all the connective tissue cells. And then there's another factor, semaphore and 3F, that's an antagonistic factor that has a very shallow gradient. So the first two rows push away from me. And what happens is everybody gets packed in. Now that causes the cells to physically get compressed and round up. So we made our little substrates and we took these connective tissue cells and just by rounding them without any cell-cell context, we can induce expression of a transcription factor called PAX9 as well as uh, MSX1, BMP4 um, that are known to drive tooth differentiation. But then we went further. We took the mesenchyme. You could separate the mesenchyme and epithelium from mouse embryos and you could actually culture them. You could actually put them back and then you could put them under the kidney capsule in another mouse and they will come back and differentiate into a tooth. So this has been known for 50, 70 years. So the first thing is we separated the epithelium and mesenchyme. We took the mesenchyme that was early stage, not yet induced, and we compressed it between two pieces of rubber. And then we basically mixed it with uh, epithelium and we got a whole tooth with white glistening uh, dentin and enamel under the kidney capsule. Okay, so, so the growth factors on all those charts are happening, but the once those growth factors change things mechanically, the mechanical signal then triggers, you don't need the growth factors anymore. That was their purpose at that time. And this iterates back and forth during development. So with engineers on board, we then took advantage of this and we developed a synthetic polymer that's a three-dimensional shrink wrap foam. And when you put mesenchymal cells in it and you bring it to 37 degrees, it causes them to shrink and go under a artificial mesenchymal condensation. And that actually induces these transcription factors. And when you put it in vivo, just with the mesenchyme, you begin to induce uh, dentin-like differentiation. Here you can see dentin protein coming up. And we've done this now with human cells. This was mouse cells. And most recently, we've modified this to make human cartilage. Uh, but this is an idea of not building an organ how you see it in vivo, but building the way it forms in the embryo by being inspired by principles that guide development. Now, the last part I want to talk about is we've also been engineering human organs in vitro, or what we call organs on chips. So when I started the institute, we had the largest single gift in Harvard's history from Hans Jörg Wies of $125 million, and we were supposed to take on high risk, high challenge projects that could bring about transformative change that you wouldn't get at with funded by NIH because it's not an iterative type of experiment, more mechanistic type of experiment. And the biggest problem I saw was that the drug development model is broken. It takes a tough study, over $2.6 billion to go from a, a discovery to approval of a drug. Many reasons for this. We do a lot of the work with cells in dishes that don't function like their bodies. You have to do animal studies to get approved by the FDA. Uh, ethical issues in terms of the animal lives, but the real problem is that more often than not, they do not predict results you get in clinical trials. And if they're grad students here and your advisor said design your next experiment by failure, you thought he'd be joking. This is how the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry works. So there's been a search for better models that would not just model cell function, but actually organ function. So when we started the institute, we have six platforms and I had one, and I had one called biomimetic microsystems. And the idea is to engineer microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions to accelerate drug development and replace animal testing. You know, why microchips? Well, I just showed you that microchip manufacturing offers control of the features at the same nanometer to micrometer scale that living cells and tissues live at. We show we can control adhesion shape function. But with George and I started to use these to make what are called microfluidic systems, where you use etching to make little channels, like you could have fluids go through and they don't mix. There's only laminar flow, and we've explored them for all sorts of applications. Industry uses these to miniaturize instrumentation. But to me, this is like an engineered microvascular network. So we put this all together and created what we call human breathing lung on a chip, which was published in Science in 2010. And the idea is not to build a whole organ, but it's to bring it, distill it down to its minimal design principles that, so you could reconstitute organ level function. And we mimic not the whole organ, but the alveoli or the air sacs where you have gas exchange, 
uh, you know, pneumonias, metastasis, uh, drug delivery, critical part. Relatively simple structure, you know, air, epithelial cell, basement membrane, flexible porous, capillary cell, blood, but the whole organ breathes, expands, and contracts. And respiratory physiologists know that the mechanics is absolutely critical for function of lung in your body. So I'm going to show you a video that shows how this works. The chip is the size of a computer memory stick made out of that same clear silicon rubber. You cut it in cross-section. There are three hollow channels, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle one is spanned horizontally into the upper and lower chamber by another silicon rubber membrane with pores coated with extracellular matrix. We then take human lung alveolar cells, put them on top, human lung capillary cells on the bottom. We just recreated the alveolar capillary interface. We then put cyclic suction through the side chambers, and because it's flexible, this actually stretches and relaxes in a cyclic way, the same degree and rate as when you're all breathing right here. We then can put air above the cells on top to create an air liquid interface. We can then flow medium with or without immune cells through the bottom, and most recently, we cover all four sides with endothelial cells, and we could flow whole human blood without anticoagulants through these devices. Now, if this were to work, you'd expect it to mimic organ function. So let's say you had pneumonia. What happens is the epithelial cell senses the bacterium. It puts out cytokines, signals that activate the endothelium to express adhesion receptors like IKM1 that then pull circulating immune cells out that had been previously flowing by. They then diapodese or migrate across and then engulf. That's homeostasis. So now I'm going to show you what it looks like through the device. These are white cells are fresh primary neutrophils taken out of my postdoc, so we know they're fresh. Uh, the endothelial cells you cannot see, and the epithelial cells are beyond the screen. To begin with, it's a quiescent blood vessel. They just fall by. Put bacteria on the other side. They get activated in four hours, express ICAM and other adhesins, pull these circulating cells out. But now you can do any imaging that you can do in a dish. So if you go to higher resolution, you're going to see one cell. And about here, it's going to find a space between two endothelial cells. This is the engineered holes in the membrane. It finds it, wiggles its rear end through the matrix out of focus to the other side. You're now going to see it come out by phase contrast, popping up through the epithelium. And then I'll show you the white blood cells in red, because I have the bacteria in GFP green. And you see them being engulfed. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response at high resolution in this little rubber chip. Now, we started to talk to companies, and they loved it, but they said, you know, the real problem are disease models, and they were also interested in drug toxicities. So we hit two birds with one stone by developing a model of pulmonary edema, fluid on the lungs. We used interleukin-2, a cancer drug. Dose-limiting toxicity is pulmonary vascular permeability increase. So if you look at time zero, air, that's what it looks like. You give this drug intravenously the way you do in patients. Two to four days, you completely fill the upper channel with fluid. This is the same dose as in patients. Now, when we quantified this, we did it with or without breathing motions, and we found without breathing motion, and these are physiological, not injurious, we don't really see much. You have to have breathing motions to see it. We developed an ex vivo ventilation and perfusion model in the mouse, and we saw the same thing. So we actually predicted something never seen before, and it's actually important because most patients with pulmonary edema are on a ventilator, so you could play with mechanics in that setting. But I had worked, as I told you, for 40 years on mechanics being important for biology, and I had actually identified the fastest signaling event we ever could find, that when you pull matrix and distort cells is a calcium influx in five milliseconds after forces going to integrin receptors and to an ion channel called TRIP-V4. And I knew that GlaxoSmithKline was working on inhibitors, and I had heard the program wasn't doing well. And I thought, maybe they'd give me drug. And they actually they didn't fund us, but they gave us the drug. And we completely inhibited this pulmonary edema response on this human lung on a chip. They then tested this in dogs and rabbits with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, completely inhibited. We had back-to-back -back papers in science translation medicine. And that drug is now in phase one clinical trials. So this one model has provided proof principle for human disease model. We had done drug toxicity, drug efficacy. Efficacy, we discovered new therapeutic targets and even led to new drug discovery. And I'm very proud it won the International Design Award two years ago. It beat out the Google Car and Frank Geary buildings. And, uh, and it's been acquired for the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art Design Collection. OK, so we didn't stop there. We, we then developed, uh, the companies were very interested in asthma and COPD. So we developed their diseases of the small airway, the bronchial. So we made the top channel higher, a millimeter, which is the radius of a small airway. We use primary lung uh, 
epithe bronchiolar epithelial cells. And um, let me bring this back. And you can see that they are ciliated. They move in a directional way. If you give fluorescent particles to measure mucociliary clearance, this is real-time clearance. It's exactly the same rate as in all of our lungs. So it's a little breathing airway on a chip. We used um, mimics of uh, viral inf inflammation, uh, infection of poly IC, and we looked at cytokines, so inflammatory response. And it was really interesting because you could see the difference between a tissue on a chip and an organ on a chip. These two bars are endothelium and epithelium alone, what happens when you mimic viral infection. And you get cytokines but low levels. But when you have both, you have crosstalk, and this is known to be happen in patients, and you get synergistic response. More recently, we now do H1N1 influenza infection on chips. We're working on new therapeutics we've discovered on chips. But I just want to show you the kind of future. Um, this is Sendai virus, GFP. So I'm going to click this. You're going to see the virus added. But we have two channels. We, we can pull out the fluid samples as this is running from the capillary channel. We now developed the 64-well microelyza. This is two. And you can see what happens to cytokine production. Boom. You're watching what's going on. You're seeing the infection. IL-6 goes up, but nothing with Rantus. And now over time, this begins to go up, and this goes up and down. And you could be relating this to molecular scale changes in cells if you have the right readouts. And I think this is going to this is something you can't do in animals and you can't do in humans. Now, we actually made chips with cells from COPD patients, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Amazingly, even though it takes three weeks to differentiate them, and then you go for another month or so on chips, they, they retain the COPD phenotype in terms of TOLAR receptors. When you give them mimics of bacterial and viral infection, which is what brings the patient to the emergency room, either infection or cigarette smoking, um, you can see the COPD patients are more s sensitive uh, in terms of expression of IL-8 when you have endotoxin mimicking bacterial infection or uh, MCSF for viral exacerbation. And this actually turns out to be a new potential biomarker that you could tell whether a patient has, needs antibiotics for bacterial infection or antivirals when they come into the hospital. Now, my postdoc, Cambus Benham, was excited about looking at smoking, so he developed a cigarette smoking robot. This is a cigarette lighter from a car. This is a Gatling gun with 10 real cigarettes. It actually can control the puff interval intensity, so you're getting smoke going to the lung, not extract the way everyone has done cigarette smoke studies in the past. And you can see that if you look at cytotoxicity or stress with hemooxygenase 1, that COPD patients, even on chips, are more sensitive and exacerbated by exposure to smoke. And the cytokines, IL-8 doubles in COPD. There's no change in normal cells when exposed to cigarette smoke. And we did gene microarrays, and the nine to the left are from a past publication of a human clinical study. The three in the right are our chips. If you just look at the top third versus the bottom, they're pretty similar. But the reviewers gave us a hard time because our replicas were so good and there was a, there were, there was a, a much lower intensity in the normal patients for the bottom two thirds. But we realized that we could do these studies better than clinical studies because we basically do matched comparative modeling of the same patient before and after a stimulus, in this case exposure to cigarette smoke, where these are all varied, different ages, different years of smoking, different types of cigarettes. Somebody might have worked in a radium mine, et cetera. So this is something we did not expect from these chips. Uh, another example, we did a human, developed the human gut on a chip. Uh, we, get, we made it wider, higher. We gave it trickling-like flow, uh, peristaltic-like deformations. We used initially human CACO2 intestinal epithelial cells originally from a tumor. Everybody says they're poorly differentiated. They normally grow as squamous cells in, in trans wells, which is how pharma uses them for barrier. But in your body, they're columnar and form villi. If we put them on the chips with flow and peristalsis for five days, this is what they look like. They spontaneously organize into intestinal villi. We characterize all the functionalities. And now we can do something that I think is really important. You've heard about the, the importance of microbiome for health and disease. Almost all the work is metagenomic or, or genetic studies because if you put living microbiome with living human cells, it's called contamination, they die. But because we have flow, villi, mucus production, we actually can keep them alive for weeks. And, we act, and this is a, pro, this is a uh, lactobacillus GG in yogurt or drugstore probiotic. And they actually get better barrier function over time which is exactly why people take these. Now, I, when I went to medical school, uh, I remember we were taught to get patients off uh, onto food as soon as possible after anesthesia because you, without peristalsis, you can get ileus, which is bacterial overgrowth, where you can die. 
And I can never understand why that happens because you had openings at both ends. And, but I wonder whether it could be mechanical. Now, the literature says it's because you stop flow. But in the body, you can't separate flow and mechanics. Here, we, we can actually do both. We can do that, and we find that it's the mechanics that controls bac bacterial overgrowth of, in, of invasive bacteria. And this is actually, um, now we're doing primary enteroids, which organoids is what everybody's moved into. This is what they look like when we make an enteroid, take it from a patient, put it on the chip. But we first time we've done gene microarray, and we could see enteroids, the chips we make them from, and the, in Vivo duodenum, they were isolated from, and the chips are much closer in terms of defense receptors, drug transporters, digestive function, et cetera, than the enteroids themselves. And finally, we recently developed a, a glomerulus on a chip. Uh, we had to develop our own iPS-derived podocytes, but the important point here is that you have to have one beat per second pulsations to be able to reconstitute glomerular filtration in vitro like in vivo. We've now up to about 15 different organs, and years ago I suggested because we have a vascular channel, we could develop a human body on chips where you'd link the channels together to do drug testing. We got a major grant from DARPA, and we now have an automated instrument that um, we've kept these alive for, we're actually up to for four weeks, but here we had eight organs, uh, linked them together fluidically, and we put drugs in them, and incredibly we're able to do in vitro to in vivo extrapolation of pharmacokinetic parameters uh, this is results we did with nicotine based on the chip. We could predict a past paper's results for three different formulations of nicotine. And, and this is really could potentially change the way things are. Where you could d d determine you know, what regimen and what dose to start with in a clinical trial from studies on chips. Uh, to end, I just have to say I'm a Harvard faculty member. I have to disclose that I hold equity in a company, Emulate, and chair its scientific advisor board that's commercializing the organs on chips that don't believe anything I said. But, uh, <laughs> and the take home message is I think biomechanics is as important as chemical and genes and these principles can be harnessed to develop new engineering innovations. And you can't do this without interdisciplinary groups and you need money to bring large enough groups together and that's why this sort of, the Allen Center I think is great for you guys and we have people from every area. I invite you to the website. We won the Webby a couple of years ago for the best uh, science website. We got bored, we made a new one, and we won two Webbies this year. So go back to it. Thank you so much. cancer cells yep. and mechanics and cancer? Um, cancer cells and mechanics or cancer cells and chips? Because we've done both. Cancer cells. cancer cells and mechanics. It's well known that cancer cells basically have a progressive breakdown of their sensitivity to these mechanical cues. So whereas if you have, let's say you have a, an epithelium and a wound, and the cells on the edge begin to spread out into the wound, and they start growing because they're spreading. And then as they get packed in, they start to shut down. And then when they regenerate it, they stop. Well, tumor cells, the set point keeps changing so that they basically think they're still spreading. And they're, this and it could be many ways. It could be through the, the stiffness and cytoskeletal linkages to integrins. It could be through nuclear structure. And a lot of the signaling pathways modulate that as well. Hi, uh, fantastic, fantastic story. Um, is there any insights of uh, neurons and mechanistic things and neurons on chips? So, I mean, neurons, the beautiful work on tensegrity and neurons between microtubules, which are stiff bundles, that actomyosin pulling and the matrix adhesions as tethers and shifting the forces between them drives neurite outgrowth. So if you take a pipette, you cut it with matrix, bind it to a ner nerve cell, wherever you pull, it will form a, a nerve process. And in the embryo, as the organs are growing, it follows tension field lines, as do endothelial cell, uh, vessel, vessels. On the chips, Kit Parker has, been, has done um, uh, neuronal cells from brain, um, human. Uh, he calls it a brain chip, but it's really neuronal networks. We've done blood-brain barrier, and we actually reconstitute the human barrier, uh, uh, level of barrier function, and then we've linked them together. We have a paper in review now where we have a blood-brain barrier 
the, the, we have endothelial cells, astrocytes, pericytes, then a cerebral spinal fluid channel. That goes to an, this brain chip with neuronal networks. By diffusion, that then goes to another blood-brain barrier, so influx, efflux, and we've done metabolomics, and it's really amazing. You can see endothelial cells actually contribute to the, to the production of, of, uh, of neurotransmitters. Uh, you know, like uh, GABA, and it, it's, so, so there are chips with neuronal cells, is the answer, yes. Oh, we over here. Hi. Um, beautiful work, but I'm, I'm wondering, in the context of uh, things like more chronic diseases, uh, how do these chips fare? Can you uh, culture, keep these in culture for months at a time? I mean, that's one of the benefits, I suppose, of an animal model is that you can sort of span the lifespan down to two years and sort of attack these things like fibrosis and, uh, and other disorders that might take a significant amount of time to develop. So, so as you know, you know, even in animal models, they, they, even a chronic condition like fibrosis, they'll often look for like early changes in the process. Um, so first off, these are like NASA's, you know, controlled environment chambers. So in theory, you can keep them going for extended time. We certainly can keep things for months in some of the chips. I mean, you'll have dropout if you have bubbles and this and that, but this company Emulate is hopefully coming out soon with automated instruments and improved chips to, to make it more robust. But uh, amazingly, what we found with these chronic diseases in the COPD is, is an example. When you take human cells out, they often retain that phenotype in vitro. But we've done uh, radiation exposure and fibrosis in lung. Uh, we are doing... Uh, 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 environmental enteric dysfunction, and malabsorption in, 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 in gut. Uh, so the answer is that it's hard, but if that's your challenge, I think you can make it work. Thank you. Thank you.